Welcome to the program. I am so glad you can join me for the hour. And if you are a regular listener, you know that a few weeks ago, I did a two-part series on Bethel Church, Redding, California, and the entire New Apostolic Reformation. My co-hosts and I were critical of the activities at Bethel and the New Apostolic Reformation because of their, well, sort of straying from Scripture and focusing more on the supernatural the signs, wonders, miracles, healings, raising the dead, etc. I had tremendous response from those two programs, part one and two. And I also featured Dirk and Joan Miller, who uh, lost a daughter. I use that word intentionally. I lost a daughter to the cult known as Bethel Church Redding, California. They programmed Caitlin with Sozo Counseling, convincing her that her parents had abused her, which was, of course, untrue. And I want to read a few responses responses from that program. Many wrote and said uh, that they had had the same experience as the Millers had. Many were very thankful for this information. A few were angry and cut this ministry off, which is the price of telling the truth. Millers had really overwhelming response from around the world, and I think 99% of it was extremely gracious and appreciative of what the Millers actually had the courage to come to a national, in fact, international microphone and and talk to the world as far as what happened to their daughter, Caitlin. I'm going to read a few responses, and I have in studio with me my now and then very often, frankly, co-hosts, Eric Barger, Jill Martin Rishi, and I'll get to them in just a minute. But let me just read a couple of the responses here, and then I want to talk about a few of them and and then read another couple of them. And, and Jill, Eric, and I want to just kind of discuss them for just – this is a short segment. We're not taking the hour to do this. We're just taking a, a short segment to do this. And, I, and let me first read a response I got from Australia. They're listening there electronically. And I'm not giving names, okay, because I don't have permission to be quoting these folks, so I'm not giving any names, but this person writes that I was a regular Bethel conference attendant looking for the encounter, the prophetic word, or the miracle. With everything in me, I believed I was going after Jesus with my whole heart, and I attended Sozo sessions thinking it will bring me into a closer relationship with the Lord and heal the areas in my soul that needed healing, but it didn't have the effect I was hoping for. I read the Bible and did various Bible studies, but there was a cloud that remained over me, and the writer goes on to say, however, the moment I decided to turn from it, and seek Jesus Christ without seeking miracles, signs, and wonders, the cloud started to lift. And he says, it felt like cords being snapped every time I repented and turned from an aspect of it. So in his mercy, my Redeemer, my Savior, placed me on a solid path. I am now completely free from depression and other issues. I am sharing this with you to encourage you to continue the good fight and to thank you for what you are doing. Your ministry is reaching not only America, but the world. One more comment here that I want to bring in, Eric and Jill. And this person says, it's a couple, we have a daughter that was part of a church that was pushing these kinds of supernatural hyped meetings. She developed mental illness and has never been whole. One of her daughters went to Bethel for a visit with a friend. She came home with a book that was very new age. Thank you so much for sharing this story. This has helped us. We always knew something was not right. You all have helped us put scripture, thought, and reason to our concerns. And let me read, before I bring in Jill and Eric, let me read a negative. And she says, your criticisms of Bethel, while done in the best of motives, I believe are harmful to the body of Christ. Yes, in every church, there are people that are extreme and do not represent the congregation well as the whole. I believe this is the case for your views on Bethel Church. There is much good and biblically correct at Bethel than there is unbiblical. And Joe and Eric, thank you for coming back in studio with me. Um, Let me just address this. Uh, Eric, to you, the, the criticism here that there's much good and biblically correct at Bethel than there is unbiblical. And I go back to Heidi Baker seemingly imparting a demon into a young man. And I, I just can't agree with the critic that says there's much more good and biblically correct than incorrect at Bethel Church Redding, California. 
Well, I think those who are predisposed to to want to accept what is going on there and elsewhere as all okay, they just try to sweep anything under the carpet that uh, might rub against that uh, predisposition. But we're challenged in Scripture to make sure that we put everything up to the test. And Mm -hmm. we had privately, we had quite a discussion about how to do that testing when we recorded those programs. And I think the first thing you do, you start looking at the scriptures, you begin to see what the scripture says, and also you begin to read between the lines and see what it is not telling us, Mm -hmm. especially about what happened in the early church and what happened during the days of Jesus and during the apostles and so on. So we just put it all up to the test of scripture because there's some There may be, and I'm sure there are, some uh, acceptable and good things happening, but there's also some of the other, and uh, we just can't excuse that which is unbiblical and maybe even demonic uh, by saying that uh, because there's something good happening, it's okay. Let's make sure that, uh, that we understand that God can be working right alongside whatever Satan is trying to do. God is there to do what he wants to do in his sovereign way. So often we try to throw it all out or accept it all. And I think either position may Mm. be wrong. So let's be careful that we test each individual case and look and see if it matches up what we see in Scripture. That is the only way we'll know what truth is. Okay, well, I think all of us here in studio are old enough to remember the shepherding movement because somebody wrote and said we were in a Christian cult back in the late 70s and early 80s called the Shepherding Movement. We joined the local church the same month that Jonestown came into the news. Of course, we did not see the handwriting on the wall until the mid-80s, lots of control. We literally became God to the church members. While we were spared the worst of the pain, there are still wounded soldiers all over the countryside 25 years later. I don't know, Jill, if you remember Shepherding Mm -hmm. Movement. So that's comparing it to what went through in Bethel. Okay, here's another one. We are losing our son to Bethel Redding. He came to the Lord out of the New Age movement and right into Bethel. Our son screams at us for questioning him and his stability and his ability to heal and prophesy and has blocked all communication with us. You know, Jill, the thing that I kept seeing in these emails to me was their connection to the New Age movement, which is really troubling. It is troubling, especially when you look at videos and you see things that people have put up about New Age meetings and Hindu meetings and the type of behaviors that you see there, they're scary in their resemblance to some of the things we're seeing out of Bethel. So that part is difficult. One thing I learned, and I learned this from my father dealing with the Word of Faith movement, that, you know, the name it and claim it, whatever you say will happen. And I learned that there are people within these movements, like very much like that lady whose email you just read, who truly love the Lord but become trapped. Mm. They become deceived by these teachers. And we have to be gentle like you have been, I think, in dealing with them and saying, here's the truth. Here's where you need to go. You're going to run into emotional responses from people because they are within these movements and you're going to run into that anger. But we have to tell them the truth. We have to say, this is what scripture teaches. And Eric, I agree 100%. You have to go immediately to scripture. We are called in Jude 3 to earnestly contend for the faith. And that is what we are doing here. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell here. My frequent co-hosts are with me today as we reflect back on the two-part series we did on Bethel Church, Redding, California, oh, several weeks ago now. Jill is the daughter of Dr. Walter Martin, Joe Martin Rishi, Eric Barger, as you well know, Take a Stand Ministries. Okay, here's another one from New Zealand. I'm pretty unhappy with me. Bill is a wonderful preacher who has great insight into the Word of God, from which he does not deviate. The clips you played are typical of a service in which there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and there is a great emotional and physical healing. Rather than condemn it, find out what the effects of such outpourings are. I know that many people have been transformed from lukewarm, pew-warming Christians into people on fire for God and wanting to do His will no matter what the cost to themselves. It is so easy to condemn, and I feel that you have joined this time with the accuser of the brethren 
in your attack on Bill Johnson and Heidi Baker. Well, again, when it comes to the new apostolic reformation, I don't feel we were attacking. I feel we were trying to inform on the dangers of the NAR movement. And then we documented when a couple loses their daughter completely to a, what I see as a Christian cult. Eric, I'm just not so sure that we're just acting on the part of the accuser of the brethren. I think we're trying to save a young lady here. As you well know, today there's a lot of Christians who would just as soon hang all the apologists because we stand in the way of being allowed to think and do whatever they want to do without any challenge. And I, I think we've got to challenge when we when we see and hear some of the things that we know from the research we did. And we know because of the responses, we knew this before we uh, presented the, the material on radio a few weeks back, that we, we now have dozens of responses from people mm-hmm. around the world who've had some of these same experiences. And uh, if anybody thinks that uh, that Bill Johnson has not diverged away from Scripture, let's just look for one example. This is something we talked about weeks ago on the program. Let's look at the idea of Jesus divesting himself of not being divine at some point in time while he was here on the earth. To me, yeah. that is that I know. is That's heresy. huge. That's mm-hmm. huge. Yes, right. it's, it is huge. That's just one thing. You know, about why people get attracted to these things, sometimes our humanity gets so involved that we, we just allow things to to pass through without trying to test them because they may bother us in the back of our hearts. We know something is wrong here, but because we like the people who are teaching us, and I, I believe these people are very likable, that has nothing to do with it, because we like them, because we are invested in their humanity, we let that stand in front of us or, or stopping us from actually doing the biblical test and thinking about these things with the Bible first. Okay, but Eric and Jill, I know what an attack is. I mean, I have had you, entire YouTubes made about me, condemning me, mocking me, even making fun of my age for Pete's sakes. That is an attack. And I know this person refers to the attack on whatever Bill Johnson and Heidi Baker. I, I think we were trying to be certainly critical of the methods used at Bethel. I don't consider it an attack. Folks, if you want to have an attack, it's not pretty. There's a there's bloodshed and we weren't doing that. Here's a YouTuber says, uh, thank you very much for this most eye-opening program and for me personally, a huge confirmation for what the Father was trying to get me to see for years. I now feel so free and pray his blessing upon you and all you are doing as a part of your program. Just stunning reality. Let me just read, probably this will be the last one, but this one was heartbreaking and I think you both know which one this is. This is a second to the last thing because this is from Assemblies of God Gail and she says on YouTube I just listened to your broadcast about Bethel Church and what's been going on there first thanks for mentioning that many Assemblies of God listeners are not in agreement with these types of goings-on I grew up in the AG and I'm still in an AG church no denomination is perfect but I can tell you the AG organization here in Illinois district is such a force for the kingdom of God there are always a few who go overboard, but the AG emphasizes checking everything with the Word of God, and I totally get being wary of anything extra biblical. So I was glad to hear from an Assemblies person, because indeed we weren't trying to attack or come against or criticize everybody who would be in the charismatic Pentecostal stream. And then let me read one more here, and this is a heartbreaker, and I'm just reading a portion of uh, Jacob's, and I'm going to stop there. I'm not given the location, but uh, he says, I'm 30 years old. I'm the father to a stolen daughter and a husband to a stolen wife. I heard your testimony of what happened, and this is written to the Millers, to your daughter Caitlin at Bethel, and my heart aches for you both. My story spans about two and a half years now. It's still going. I suspect the worst isn't even behind me yet. He continues to write, My wife's family, heavily involved in Bethel Church, your story resonated with me so much. I, too, experienced things so traumatic I can barely articulate them. I was in the hospital with an autoimmune disease the first night. My loving wife was there by my side. And the next day, her family came to town, told my wife that God told them I was going to hurt her and that God told them that she needed to get away from me because I was allegedly being controlling. They convinced her that God told them that my control would 
result in physical abuse. Never in the history of our marriage has my wife ever expressed concern for her safety. Now I had not spoken with her family in about a year before this. Uh, While I was in the hospital, her family told my nurse that they just knew my sickness was brought on by a spiritual matter, specifically an unforgiveness in my life. They had in the past convinced my wife to leave me until I reconciled with their beliefs, which would have been of Bethel Church. They told me that I was addicted to my wife and that I had a spirit of idolatry that I needed to cast out and that I had a spirit of self-pity and that I needed that cast out. And since separation, my wife has accused me of controlling her left the state with our daughter, abandoned me in the hospital. I would not tell me where she was staying. And yet when her parents under the Bethel false teachings told her that I was dangerous, she believed them without even questioning her own conscience and experiences with me in our six years of marriage. She would not let me have any kind of relationship with my two-year-old daughter and then accused me of being manipulative when I brought it to the court's attention. And again, thanks us for the information on the New Apostolic Reformation and uh, very, very appreciative of everything that he learned. Jill? A very dangerous situation and very painful. Uh, Right away when you see things like this and hear things like this, you think, what did Jesus say? Love one another as I have loved you. This is not the fruit that we are seeing from Bethel. We are seeing dangerous things that are very reminiscent of cults. And as far as dealing with Bill Johnson and his teaching, you know, I always go to James 3, 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. We are required to look at what someone is teaching, what the fruit of that ministry is. And unfortunately, this has been going on for years. It's been all over the internet. So it's not just one or two or three things that are, you know, that you're pulling up here. It's a pattern of behavior over a period of years. And it cannot be ignored. And we as Christians cannot silent in the face of it. One more here, an email, and this is from Australia. Not going to give their names here, but we have three children live in the Gold Coast Queensland, Australia. We are a family that believes in God and our oldest daughter uh, went to Bethel. We've suffered similar to yourselves, referring to the Millers. After years of shock, anger, tears, and not knowing what to do, and many, many hours of research, we still have hope. We have talked endlessly about how to rescue our daughter since we understood the situation. I could read many, many more folks, but we're going to stop there. But here's what Eric Chill and I tried to bring out in that uh, two-part taping and that is a few weeks ago now. And that is this Kundalini spirit that has come into the church. And then I got several emails saying, well, would you mind exposing something else that's Kundalini spirit? And that's so-called Christian yoga. So when I get back, the three of us are going to talk about that for at least a portion of a segment anyway. Christian yoga. Can you sanctify yoga? I don't think so. We'll try to make a case for that when I get back. Don't go away. Today's edition of Understanding the Times, as well as our broadcast next week, will provide some great insights into deception in the church. If you're considering obtaining your own recording of today's program, you might want to wait until next week to ask for this two-part series. To order a CD copy of what you hear on any program, the order line number is 763-559-4444. Or you can order from our web store at olivetreeviews.org. As you may know, our next annual fall conference is scheduled for the last Saturday in September. That September 29th conference is a ticketed event. However, it will also be live streamed. At no cost to you, you can watch the entire conference from the comfort of your own home. Or you could host your own Understanding the Times conference at your own church and invite all your friends and relatives who are interested in understanding end-time events in light of Scripture. For full conference details, visit us online at olivetreeviews.org. With so much activity and travel, the summer months are always hard to keep broadcast ministry budgets current. We invite you to partner financially with us. Your tax-deductible gifts are welcome when you write to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Understanding the Times 2018 is almost sold out now. 
why don't you consider getting a group together to live stream the event at your computer or perhaps put it on a big screen. There is no cost or registration involved for streaming. Our speakers include Amir Serafati, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Pastor Billy Crone, Pastor J.D. Farag, and Eric Barger. We will help you understand that nothing is falling apart. In fact, things are all falling together. Events that could be interpreted as chaotic and dark are really a herald of his return. We'll also help you contend for the faith. Fellowship with like-minded is essential for spiritual health and to stay optimistic and looking up. Our event and live streaming is Saturday, September 29th, but you will be able to access the archived programming following that event. I promise our speakers and their topics will keep you focused on the bigger picture. God has everything under control. The King is coming right on time. He's never early, he's never late, and he wants none to be left behind. Hello, everyone. This is Bill Solace, the founder of Prophecy Depot Ministries, and I've been honored to be a guest on Jan Markell's radio show, and I listen to it on a frequent basis. She covers so many different diverse topics, not only prophecy, but dealing with the signs of our times and the political things that are going on with excellent guests. I've seen her show grow from several hundred radio stations up to, I think it's 830 some now, if not more, because people are interested in this show. I highly encourage you to listen to Jan Markell on a frequent basis. The philosophy behind yoga is much more than physically improving oneself. It is an ancient practice derived from India, believed to be the path to spiritual growth and enlightenment. The word yoga means union, and the goal is to unite one's transitory or temporary self with the infinite Brahman, the Hindu concept of God. So, is it possible for a Christian to isolate the physical aspects of yoga as simply a method of exercise without incorporating the spirituality or the philosophy behind it? On today's Understanding the Times broadcast, Jan Markell, Eric Barger, and Jill Martin Rishi are teaming up to talk about current events affecting the church today. Let's go back to that conversation. And welcome back. Remember, this program is always posted to my website Saturday morning, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. So many of you are racing around and you don't have time to catch it on the radio. You can also just go to oneplace.com and download their mobile app. And the program will be downloaded Saturday morning every week. And you can just take it on your phone or your device with you anywhere you go. Okay, we are uh, building on programming we did several weeks ago, Bethel Church, Redding, California. We did that in the first segment, and I want to bring that to an end so we can move on to another topic related, and that's this kundalini spirit again that's um, gotten into the church. And uh, I think, uh, Jill, you wanted to make a really pertinent comment before we totally move on from the emails that we've been reading. Yes, it's just this whole idea that uh, Christians can be possessed by Mm -hmm. demons, whether it's the demon of Jezebel or the demon of idolatry. That is totally un- biblical. We are not apartment buildings where God inhabits the first floor and 10 stories up. There's a whole bunch of different demons. That's not how it works. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He will not tolerate anything like that sharing space with him. So any belief that Christians can be possessed or controlled by demons is completely unbiblical. Yeah, yet I know churches that are having sessions trying to cast out demons. Yes from Christians, and it's just kind of a regular practice. Eric, you wanted to make a quick comment? Well, just that there are all kinds of problems that happen when you do entertain the you know, the demonic. We're warned not to chase after signs, and I think that's important. And uh, let's yes. put let's remember that when people say that God told me, that was something we talked about at the end of the first segment, that's a very subjective statement. It could be, but let's also put what is said in that context to, to the test of Scripture. You know, we have one of the people associated with the leadership of uh, Bethel Redding wrote in one of their books that uh, to go to Southern Oregon was uh, a very spiritual place. 
place. You know, we go there and it's really a place to be in touch with God. Folks, I, I've been through Southern Oregon many, many times in my life. I've lived in the Seattle area and driven through there. I've been through there. I can't wait to get through there when mm-hmm. I have to go that direction because of the darkness in Southern Oregon. Hmm. And I think these folks have lived around that kind of the Mount Shasta spirit of the New Age movement for so long that they have trouble discerning what is the spirit of God and what is another spirit that's masquerading. Well, I played some audio clips. Actually, they're video clips on radio. We're limited. You can't get the visual, but clips that would probably give indication that this so-called Kundalini Hindu type spirit is invading the church, which is just about the worst thing that can invade a church. And then folks wrote me, well, how about Christian yoga? Because Christian yoga, yoga in general, is implementing this kundalini as well. It's out of India. It's Hindu. And my position is that you cannot sanctify Hinduism. You cannot sanctify yoga. Yoga is Hinduism. Let me just make a a couple of comments here that I want to engage in some discussion on this. Because for many in the West who don't understand the history behind it, yoga is simply a means of physical exercise and strengthening and improving flexibility of the muscles. However, the philosophy behind yoga is much more than physical physically improving oneself. It is an ancient practice derived from India, as I've said now three times, believed to be the path to spiritual growth and enlightenment. The word yoga means union, and the goal is to unite one's transitory or temporary self with the infinite Brahman, the Hindu concept of God. So, I think the question for the three of us becomes, is it possible for a Christian to isolate the physical aspects of yoga as simply a method of exercise without incorporating the spirituality or the philosophy behind it? Jill and Eric, yoga originated with a blatantly anti-Christian philosophy, and that philosophy has not changed. It teaches one to focus on oneself instead of the one true God. It encourages its participants to seek answers answers to life's difficult questions within their own consciousness instead of the Word of God. So the question becomes, I'll address it to to you, Jill, is it possible for a Christian to isolate the physical aspects of yoga as simply a method of exercise without incorporating the spirituality or the philosophy behind it? Well, I think if they do that, and a lot of them do attempt to do that or do it based on ignorance, they're really divorcing history from practice. Because if you go back into the ancient Indian culture, you see that kundai means a coil, something coiled, something powerful coiled. And that's what's coiled at the base of your spine when you're doing yoga. You're opening yourself up to things that you have no idea of the power of and what they can do. If they cannot possess you, they will oppress you. And that's something that I as a Christian would not want to walk freely into. I would want to understand what it was I was practicing every day. Even if if you try to write it off as just physical exercise, wouldn't you want to question Hmm. where it came from? How did it come together? Wouldn't you want to explore the history of it a little bit? And yoga is something that is dangerous from the perspective of worship. On virtually every corner in India, there is an idol and an altar, and you will see people in front of it doing yoga positions. Hmm. Why? Because yoga is worship. Who are they worshiping? Not the God of the Bible. Well, it's about 330 million gods, I yeah. think. Small mm, G, right. of course. Eric, what do you say to the millions of Christians who continue to say, well, it is good exercise and it's a very helpful health tool that I've tapped into? To all of the denominations, you can go up and down the street and find Christian yoga. What do you say to these people? First thing I would say, if I only had a minute, is just say, do you realize that yoga is to merge with Hindu gods? Because yoga itself means to yoke or to be part of. And you think about these, the deities of Hinduism that are attached to yoga and there's no way to unattach them. You know, the Hindu yogis themselves are, I think, a a place to to look to, to find out information about what yoga is. And I was doing research and now have this in one of my messages. This is a teacher at the Classical Hindu Yoga Academy. He says, is yoga a religion that denies Jesus Christ? His answer is yes. 
just as Christianity denies the different Hindu divas, and we're talking about the the different uh, gods of Hinduism, he says that it has nothing to do with God and Jesus Christ. As Hindus, we live the yogic lifestyle. We appreciate that others understand that all of yoga is about the Hindu religion. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't take my cues from Hindu masters, but when they make those kind of statements, they're speaking directly to us, and I think they're exactly right on that. Let me play a quick clip here. It's uh, Carol Matriciana. She passed away about a year ago, I believe. I passed from cancer, and she has an outstanding film, Yoga Uncoiled, and she's dialoguing here with Dr. Dave Reagan and Nathan Jones on Christ and Prophecy Television. I want to get into our discussion in this segment by reading you a statement that was made recently by Al. Albert Moeller, who is the president of uh, Southern Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, he spoke out against uh, the practice of yoga, and he generated a storm of controversy. Uh, as you yeah, know, this I is a very controversial. <laughs> and he said this, quote, The idea that the body is a vehicle for reaching consciousness with the divine is not Christianity. Christians who practice yoga must either deny the reality of what yoga represents or fail to see the contradictions between their Christian commitments and their embrace of yoga. What is your response? Well, their embrace of Eastern mysticism, that's exactly what it is, because yoga was specifically designed for a purpose within Eastern mysticism. One, to awaken the idea that we are divine and that divinity is within us and we are one with everything. The second is to shorten our reincarnation cycle, to prepare us for our reincarnation cycle. That's the purpose of yoga. Cycle. The purpose <laughs> of yoga is to teach you how to die in order that you can come back in your next life as a better person. It's suicide? So, it's suicide. <laughs> yoga is suicide. It, it is a discipline to prepare you for death in the within the context hmm. of Hinduism, which believes that your spirit, that you don't die, that you come back again and again and again. In fact, Gandhi said that reincarnation is a hope cycle of imprisonment. The Hindu knows they cannot get out of reincarnation, that they're going to be born again, die again, born again, die again. So my question would be to a Bible-believing Christian that understands that Jesus Christ died because we were separated from him through our sins. He died in order to give us reconciliation with life for eternity. We've got reconciliation through Jesus. Why practice a discipline designed for death? So basically what you're saying is that the term Christian yoga is an oxymoron. Well, like a lot of things in the new emerging <laughs> Christianity, that's exactly what it is. It's Christianized occultism, Christianized Hinduism. Uh, in fact, in my movie, Yoga Uncoiled, the Hindus are very angry with Christians that try and steal their religion and Christianize it. And yet Christians will say, well, I can separate it. I can actually do, I, I only do the spiritual exercises. But let's question that. I, I play tennis. I don't play Christian tennis. <laughs> I, 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 we do exercises for our body, and we can do gymnastics and flex and stretch. That, that's called gymnastics. The moment you call it yoga, yoga means to yoke, to unite with God consciousness. Many of the positions used within yoga are the names of the deities. Those positions are called asanas. And those positions are a deity that you become and you merge with within an Eastern worldview. So if they want to do stretching and flexing, which I do every time before I play tennis, I think about the muscle I'm pulling, I think about the muscle I'm stretching, I think about the position I'm going in order to, you know, do the appropriate stretching. I don't think of a cobra, which is one of the positions in yoga. <laughs> is that cobra. that three, third finger thing where they sit like that? You know that, what, or? you shouldn't do a mudra like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me why. Why shouldn't I do that? Because that is believed to be part of the prayer that you pull in the vibrations, you hold your hand in a particular way and you say that word om which is a vibration of a god because wow. everything is god consciousness our positions our repetitive prayers which are called mantras you say the name of the deity and they believe that the vibration saying om connects you to the vibration that began the world you see the basis of yoga is evolution and evolution is the faith of Hinduism that everything is becoming better. 
If you are a Bible-believing Christian, you understand that nothing is getting better. We're on a decline. We're getting worse. Yes. There are two opposing worldviews. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have in studio with me Jill Martin Rishi, the daughter of Dr. Walter Martin, and Eric Barger. You hear them frequently on this program as they come in as co-hosts as, uh, as often as I can bring them in. And let me quickly say, Carol Matriciana was referring to her film Yoga Uncoiled. You can only get that. Here's the website, folks, and you can only get it at this website. No phone numbers, I'm sorry. Brokenbutnotcrushed.com. Brokenbutnotcrushed.com. You can find Yoga Uncoiled there. You have to do it electronically. And the reason we're talking about this is we followed up here in my first segment with the program we did on Bethel Church Reading, California, and the Kundalini spirit. That is a spirit that's out of India, and as a result, people wrote me and said, well, Jan, you've got to say something about this yoga in Christian yoga because it's infecting every church, practically every church in my town. And there's actually a Christian yoga website. I'm not going to give the URL. I don't want everybody to go running to it. But they say on their website, we are a network of Christians practicing yoga to go to God the way God came to us and in and through the body. And then they go on to say, we are writers and teachers, pastors and preachers, mothers and fathers, husbands and wives. We are dancers, musicians, artists, medical doctors, counselors, social workers, community activists. We are Baptist, Catholic, Episcopal, Lutheran, Methodist. They go on to list many other denominations. We are drawn together through our individual and collective experience that yoga and meditation deepens our Christian faith. There's nothing here to buy, we simply feel called to share our experience with the hope they'll draw others to deepen their faith through embodied contemplative practices. And then they conclude, yoga is a practice that helps me pay attention to God in my body. Yoga helps me honor my body, both its limitations and its victories, and therefore also honor my soul. My goodness. For me, yoga is an intensely spiritual practice. For many people, Christian or not, yoga is a spiritual practice. That is on that website. I'm not giving the address, folks. You don't need to go there. And, and then Relevant Magazine says this, Lots of things that were once pagan have been co-opted by Christians and used for worship. The most obvious examples being Christmas and Easter. Both have very pagan roots. To say that Christians can't take a practice that was intended for something else and use it to worship God is to ignore not only history but the transformational power of Christ. Oh my. Jill, I hope that troubles you as much oh, as it yeah. troubles me. Anytime you're bowing in the beginning of yoga, you say namaste, which means I bow to the divine light in you. So right there, that ought to be a big red flag for everybody. And the final thing is when Hindu yogis, as we've said before here, refer to yoga as Hindu evangelism and something that is literally invaded and spread throughout right. our culture, opening people's minds and hearts to to the broad knowledge and hope, quote unquote, of Hinduism, which is about as hopeless as you can possibly get in its theology, then you know we really have a big problem here with the practice of yoga. Another thing I noticed as I was researching this, Eric, and I know you've seen the same thing, is these folks who are so into this Again, whether whatever the Kundalini experience is, and maybe it's contemplative prayer. In this case, we're talking more specifically about yoga and the so-called oxymoron known as Christian yoga. They're quoting Richard Foster. They're quoting Henry Nouwen. They're quoting mystics who are not solid. Now, I know as I say that, I'm offending people, but honestly, why would anybody want to follow a guy, Richard Foster, who says when you enter into this kind of mystical prayer, you got to pray a prayer of protection for yourself. <laughs> well, we, we all know how popular this is today, too, because of, of the whole emergent postmodern philosophy that's mm -hmm. now strewn throughout our churches. But you've got to once again go back to the origins. And uh, as you know, Jan, I, I wrote about this in my chapter in the book Deceivers that you and I both had a chapter mm -hmm. in. And I talked about um, right there in the Minneapolis area, you know, what is happening uh, in Minneapolis and a particular pastor, Doug Paget, whose wife has a yoga center attached 
attached to the church. And what they say about it is just exactly what you just said, is the idea that you're connecting with God in a new and vibrant way, but it's really an old way. And, you know, these same folks want to attach the uh, labyrinths and the chanting and mystical techniques and so on. It's very popular today, but very unbiblical at the same time. And it's it's all about the justification, how you can get closer to God by using yoga to get there. Yet this is not the God of the Bible we're getting close to when we decide to give our bodies over in that way. Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to change course here for my closing segment, and it's a short segment. We got a conference coming to St. Louis next week that I think the three of us need to at least make my audience aware of called Revoice. And I caught a headline which really caught my eye. This is a month or so ago. Uh, Don't rejoice over revoice. And we're going to explain why in my closing segment. So don't go away. Coming right back. Understanding the Times listening family is expanding. We thank God we're reaching more people than ever before. It's partially due to the faithfulness of our audience to support this ministry. You can help us continue our coverage around the United States Please consider becoming a financial partner with us. All tax-deductible gifts are welcome when you write to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also give securely online at olivetreeviews.org or dial 763-559-4444. Jan, Eric, and Jill return right after this. Olive Tree Ministries is carrying a new product to help you contend for the faith and understand the times. It is Terry James' new book, Deceivers, Exposing Evil Seducers and Their Last Day's Deception. Our generation is characterized by deceiving tactics in the church, the media, the schoolroom, the government, the globalist agenda, and much, much more. I have contributed a chapter in the book talking about the deception that has invaded the church in the last 30 years. Find the book in our web store at olivetreeviews.org, the hardbound 320-page reference book. You can call us to order at 763-559-4444, 763-559-4444. It is also featured in our print and e-newsletter. Sign up online. Don't let the deceivers fool you or those you care about. Many are falling for these deceptions and delusions of our day. Stay in tune and up to date. Order Deceivers today. Because people in LGBT circles that are trying to come into the church are considered victims. And so the new conversation begins with victim mentality that many people have been victimized. Right. But we're supposed to be victors and overcomers in the body of Christ. And to teach people to be a true disciple of Jesus is not to leave them in victim mentality, but to call them into maturity as true disciples of Jesus who are separate from the ways of the world and holiness. Once again, Jan Markell. And we're wrapping up our program. I've got co-hosts in studio with me, Jill Martin Rishi and Eric Barger. And let me just say, and Jill manages our social media, so you can find us on Facebook, Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries, and you can find us on Twitter at Olive Tree Men. And uh, Jill, now we're on Instagram as well. Well covered, and thank you for all you do there. You can get a CD of any program. Why don't you consider a CD subscription? It's a very nominal cost, but you do have to call us on that because only on CD subscription do we need to process that with a credit card. So give us a call. You get a CD of this program or any program that you hear without any kind of CD subscription. I kind of teased in my last segment that I wanted to talk about a conference coming up here in the next week. It's called Revo. I saw the headline, Don't Rejoice Over Revoice, and an uh, excellent radio personality has been warning of this Revoice conference in St. Louis. It's going to be July 26th, 27th, 28th, and that would be Janet Mefford. She's done an outstanding job of exposing what this is all about. It's at Memorial Presbyterian Church, and the event describes itself as an effort to support, encourage, and empower homosexual and lesbian Christians while devoting themselves to the historic teachings of 
on marriage. And on the website, it says, we gather together with other gender and sexual minorities and those who love them and experience a new kind of gospel community. That's from the Revoice website. It's Memorial Presbyterian, is a member of the Presbyterian Church in America, or PCA, a denomination that broke away from the more liberal uh, Presbyterian Church USA years and years ago. And Janet Mefford herself has been using her platform to allege that the PCA, after standing against liberal theology for decades, is now surrendering to it. And I'd like to play a six-minute clip of Janet talking to a former homosexual, and she'll introduce him, and then my co-host and I will have a real brief discussion to wind up our program. Well, just recently, I did a show warning Christians about a pro-LGBT Christianity conference set for the end of July in St. Louis at a Presbyterian Church in America congregation. This is the breakaway denomination founded by conservative Presbyterians. The name of the conference is Revoice. And last week, we got into all the details about what these ostensibly Christian leaders are pushing. They're pushing on biblical terminology and on biblical theology on the Church of Jesus Christ to advance pro-gay propaganda within the body of Christ. It's as simple as that. And when we encounter something like this, we have to respond with the word of God, which is God-breathed and profitable for reproof and correction, Scripture says. So we're going to go back and lay out for you today a biblical refutation of the Revoice Conference, and we're going to do it with some help from my friend Stephen Black, who is Executive Director of First Stone Ministries. I don't know anybody out there who's more able to refute the lies of so-called gay Christianity with the Bible than Stephen. The Lord set him free from homosexuality over 30 years ago. He is Chairman of the Board of Directors for Restored Hope Network and author of Freedom Realized, Finding Freedom from Homosexuality and Living a Life Free from Labels. Stephen, just an honor to welcome you back. How are you, my friend? I'm great. Thank you so much. Honored to be here. Great to have you. My first question, I want to know why you weren't invited to address this conference. It seems like they could use somebody who's been set free by Jesus Christ and could actually testify to that. Yeah, they're, 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 they're not interested in that. If you actually look at the lineup of speakers, you have people that identify as gay. Three of the main presenters actually call themselves gay Christians. So, wow. um, yeah, they're not interested in someone like me. Yeah, which is a real shame and I think right away exposes what their agenda truly is. What is your general perspective? You've had a chance, I know, to look at the website for Revoice. You see all these names. You know, you know, people like Wesley Hill and Preston Sprinkle and some of these people who've been around for a while. What is your general perspective when you read the description of Revoice and saw some of the workshops they're offering? What did you think about it? Well, it's something that we're facing in the church at large which is you have people from higher learning who get credentials behind their name and they become what seemingly is an authoritative voice with taking the construct of the uh, psychological understanding of orientation that is underscored as something that is unchangeable and they kind of mix it with this uh, grace teaching and on the other side of it they come out with gay Christianity. So in the simplest of terms that is kind of the broad over global picture of what we are seeing with every one of these people that align with the idea of gay Christianity, that grace somehow covers and allows for the inner world of a person to have unnatural desires, to have lust and desires that that really don't need to be checked in because orientation, psychology says this is an identity. And so it's, it becomes a part of who these people are. They are gay. And so the, and then what they're communicating now is that the church must accept this higher learning of psychology because it's coming from, you know, very educated people that LGBT and even on their own website, LGBT, and then they have that plus there. Yeah. People should pay attention to that plus because that means lots of other things. So when the plus is there and they're actually underscoring that transgenderism, homosexuality, desire and feelings, although they would say celibate, this is something the church must start accepting and embracing. Yes, it's a special category, though. This is one of the things that's quite striking to me, Stephen. We don't see this sort of excuse making of identity and orientation for just about anybody else I can think of who goes under the name Christian. So why does this particular sin get a special dispensation? They are trying, and, and rightfully so, the church does need to be compassionate 
And so they're trying with an underscoring of new conversation right. that is compassionate. But actually, it's not the compassionate uh, the compassion of our Lord. It's human compassion that gets this mixture of lust and desire and 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 kind of a self pity because people in LGBT circles that are trying to come into the church are considered victims. And so the new conversation begins with victim mentality that people that are struggling, and and no doubt, I would be the first to admit, doing this ministry for over 30 years, that many people have been victimized. But we're supposed to be victors and overcomers in the body of Christ, and to teach people to be a true disciple of Jesus is not to leave them in victim mentality, but to call them into maturity as true disciples of Jesus who are separate from the ways of the world and holiness. So they come in with this very, you know, posturing and posing and whimsical, uh, you know, even delightful personalities that kind of woo in the church of the idea we need to be kind and loving, and that means compromise. Okay, this conference is coming up July 26th, 27th, 28th, Memorial Presbyterian Church in St. Louis, according to the Revoice website. Scheduled speakers include an open homosexual, a bisexual man, a woman who is attracted to women but is married to a man, and straight speakers who welcome open lesbians and homosexuals in the church. Titles from some of the events that will be featured during those three days, Redeeming Queer Culture and Adventure, A Journey to Embrace, A Conversation on Empowering the Church to Embrace the LGBT Plus Community in Fresh Ways. Ah, I could go on and on and on, but Eric, you can see why I am concerned about this event coming up. Well, I am too, and for a number of reasons. First of all, you'll never hear Romans 1 being discussed by these folks. True. And uh, they have tried to do away with uh, Leviticus by saying, well, we eat shellfish, don't we? Because there's a passage there that deals with, with this practice. This has become probably the spot where the gauntlet has been thrown down across our culture as much as anything mm-hmm. else. And there may be some other areas such as abortion and um, Islam, etc. But this is really a big deal. Let me say I was a PCA yes, youth pastor. Yes, you were. Many, many years ago, and though I wasn't a PCA member, I wasn't in the PCA before I became a youth pastor, just the way the circumstance happened, I believe that the pastor I pastored with would be shocked if he could see this. Uh, I I knew Dr. D. James Kennedy. He interviewed me a couple of times on a couple of my books, and even though I am not a a Presbyterian by any means theologically, I think he would be absolutely astounded that this is happening in a PCA church. And lest anyone think that this is a group merely renting the this church facility. You should understand that the lead pastor of the church, Greg Johnson, is one of the presenters at this conference. They are endorsing this. Jill, you have a thought on this? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'm glad you mentioned Romans 1 there, Eric, because what I find fascinating in these culture wars is we are always called on the carpet by some cultural warriors here, secular, uh, who insist that we do everything scientifically. Everything must be related to science. They revere science, correct? But what's often passed over in Romans 1 is a scientific argument that Paul is making here. And Mm -hmm. I'll just read just a short amount of it here where it says, they exchange the truth of God for the lie, worshiped and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchange the natural natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. There is a scientific argument in there, basically. This is not when you look at anatomy, when you look at the biological aspect of things in this world from a strictly scientific viewpoint, this makes no sense. Homosexuality does not not fit. And that is an argument that is actually made in Romans that we don't hear a lot about. We have talked about a lot this hour. We started talking about this Kundalini spirit that has invaded the church. And I mean, the East has seduced the West. I kind of make, make that conclusion. And then we've kind of morphed into just alerting my audience about a conference coming up next week. It, you can be praying about it, folks. And we're not calling these people vile. We're really not. And I'm sure many of them love the Lord with all
all their heart. And, and I believe the leadership here could be very confused. We need to be praying for them, praying that some of these who aren't free can be set free. And I can't say it enough. I mean, we're in an upside down world. And like I often say, we're not in Kansas anymore and things aren't falling apart. They're falling into place. It says in Isaiah 33, 6, that God and only God is the stability of our times. Everything else will disappoint us and let us down. Won't you call on him today? Make him Lord and Savior of your life. It may be too late to do it tomorrow. 